down on me let your love shine through me in the night and lead me Lord I'll follow anywhere you open up the
far gone so little so just as he's a word back then he's working now my god will never change he has great power in I know my God can do it to him, there's nothing to it. I know he'll see me through a sweet victory. And when the storms are raging, he is the rock of ages. I know that he is able, mighty is he. And I know my God can do it to him, there's nothing to it. I know he'll see me through a sweet victory. And when the storms are raging, He is the rock of ages. I know that He is able, mighty is He. I know that He is able, mighty is He. good to see brother mark smile and i'm telling you what uh, i look out there and see him smile makes me smile uh, that's the way it is and it's good to be with y'all again and just to thank you for allowing us to come and to worship together with y'all and just to serve the lord amen and uh as you see uh since we've been here uh, god has made a change in the ministry uh, the crusaders and it's not that she's a stranger but uh she's was usually out there and little did she know that God had a, a plan for her to be up here and she is doing such a good job would you make Ashley Dawson welcome tonight and would you like to share what is your yes. well <laughs> no we've been dating we have been dating for three years and May the 11th which was on dad's birthday she thought we were going to celebrate Dad's birthday. Well, after we got done eating, they wanted to do something for Dad's birthday, so they got got a cheesecake, and I was like, "Well, I want to get a cheesecake too." Well, when they brought hers out, something shiny was on it. So May the eleventh, I proposed to her. And, uh, so this is my fiance, Ashley. Amen. And so uh, it's, you know, after the end of this year, if if they hold out that long. <laughs> Uh, we'll all be tallies up here on and uh, so uh, she asked me was we gonna be the tally trio I think that name's already took but <laughs> but it's just good to to worship and to serve the Lord and so we're excited about what God is doing we ought to be excited because he's coming back he's coming back real soon I believe with all of my heart and uh, the signs of the times are everywhere but you know God is still so good amen I believe that he is, and listen to the message of this song. around me as I face my greatest 
his fears. You see, I had more gains than losses, and I know more joy than hurt. As his grace rolled down upon me, I deserve for God's being good. dreams when I go sleep each night. Though I had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. Through it all, God's been good. For God has been my Father. His love is my beginning, and His love will be my end. I can speak forever, trying to tell you everything is. Oh, but the best way that I can say is this. For God's been good in my life. I've been blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. Though I had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them. If I could through it all, God's been good. Through it all, through it all, for God's been good. See? 
and hollow arms ago we were uh, down in Angola prison was in there for three days and uh, had a good time getting to be a part of a, a big event that's known as returning hearts and uh, it's quite an event where uh, the dads go through what's called uh, a program for a year called Malachi dads and once they complete that they can they will bring their children in for a day and they'll get to spend the day with them uh, out in the rodeo arena there at uh, Angola. And during that day, we, we were there, and when the guardians would bring the kids and drop them off to the, 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 the people that shadowed the dad and, the, and, and the, the child, then we would be able to minister to the, uh, the guardians uh, in another area. And after he left, I said, uh, Chaplain Tony, if you'll just make your way on down here to the front. And so as he got to the front, I began to go into an invitation. And we began to sing, lead, lead the folks in a sinner's prayer. And there were 17 got saved. And so when they started standing up and coming forward, I said, I need some of the Awana volunteers to come and counsel. And their eyes was big. They wasn't expecting that. We're to go out expecting to tell people about Jesus Christ. It ought not be a shock if somebody gets saved. When we present the gospel, things can happen. And whether it's you that's presenting it to a friend out on the street or in your home, we ought not be shocked if God saves them because of the fact that the gospel is powerful. And, uh, and so it was just a great time uh, that day. And, uh, you know, going into the prisons, we do a lot of that. Uh, we'll be in uh, Bayou Dorchit over at uh, the shell plant area on uh, Monday night, tomorrow night. We'll be in over there. Uh, we had a great time there. was there on February the 22nd the last time. And uh, we saw 48 men come to know the Lord that night. Uh, was preaching there, Brother Mark, didn't get done in this uh, 
a black guy, he stands up over in the back and he, I, he raises his hand and I said, Preacher, I'm tired of running. I need Jesus. He got up out of his pew and come down here and just stood. I said, anybody else tired of running? A couple more got up. Well, then about three or four minutes, there was 48 men standing down there. Prayed and accepted Jesus Christ. Well, I'm not get excited when the gospel's presented because it can change people's life. When we see folks get saved, there were so many standing around there, I had to stand up, up on top of the sub speaker to see over them. There were so many down there. I'm excited what God's doing. Uh, Angola Prison, I, I want to tell you, if you've never been down there, I'd encourage you to go at some point in time. It's amazing to see what God is doing inside those prison walls. I believe that's where the next great revival is breaking out is in the prison systems with all my heart. I believe that. I believe God is going to use it because those men and women, they get to the very bottom and they don't have any place to look up and they understand what a broken, trite heart is. And they accept Jesus and they get sold out. I'm talking about they say there's jailhouse religion. I, I wish we had jailhouse rel religion in the churches today because over 47% of the 7,200 people there know Jesus Christ personally. It, it is amazing what's going on down there. And so we, we've just had a great time. We've, we've had the, the privilege of seeing God save uh, this year uh, 200 and, huh? What? 280 this year. And so we're, we're just elated with what God's doing and what he continues to do. And so, um, y'all pray for us as we continue to go and, and go and see where God places us at. And God is using us in a mighty way. I want Stephen to come down here. And uh, uh, he's, uh, since we've been here, God has really done some uh, remarkable things. And uh, I want him to share a little bit about what God uh, continues to do in his life and what happened. And uh, uh, it's just been a blessing. Um, I've been raised uh, my entire life by my grandparents, and they've had a big influence on my life. And on when I was nine years old, I walked down the aisle and got saved and everything. Well, thought I got saved. Let me rephrase that. And uh, on February the 22nd, though, of this year, though, I actually got saved. Amen. And... Well, everything was going as usual at the house, and Jonathan and Ashley were having some, some problems. And Jonathan got That's saved. not usual, though. <laughs> That's not usual. That's not usual. Let me just uh, rephrase it. That's not what I meant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh,. And anyway, and uh, Jonathan had gotten saved first. Well, Miss Penny told me I needed to come in there when they were talking to him. And then he got, after he got saved, she asked me if I was saved. And I really couldn't answer that. I'd had some doubts before, but I always thought it was the devil telling me I wasn't saved. But the devil won't ever tell you that you're not saved. He doesn't want you to be saved. It's, all, it's God telling you you're not saved. And if, if you feel you're not saved or not, it's not because the devil's telling you. It's because God's telling you. But on the, the 22nd, he, uh, after a lengthy time, and uh, he, he had, to, after I asked him, after Penny did, and I, and I looked at him, and I, you know, of course, the preacher kicked in at that point, and I said, so, Stephen, if you die, where are you going to spend eternity? And he said, in hell. And I said, uh, well, what do you want to do about it? And he'd get quiet. And for about 30 minutes, hey, he's heard the Roman roads pro probably more than most folks here in a lifetime. He's heard the gospel presented hundreds of times. And I asked him, I said, well, what are you waiting on, Stephen? I said, what's holding you back? He was worried about what folks would think. He was worried about because he'd worked in church all of his life since he was nine years old. 
And he was worried about what those people would think. And so I told him, I said, don't be concerned about what they think. You get it right. You get it right. And he turned and he knelt down on the couch there and prayed and asked the Lord to save him. And I saw a changed man get up from there. And moments before that, this one had knelt on the other couch. And two years prior to that, that one over there knelt on the third couch. So there's three couches in our living room. If you've got some folks, we'll rent that room out to you real cheap. And, uh, and so, you know, it's just been a, a remarkable time that we've had. But it's all because when you, as I shared with you, when you get, start presenting the gospel, when you preach Jesus and him crucified, things happen. And we've, we've had some close calls on the bus, but I wasn't concerned at that time because I thought my house was saved. I thought my whole family was saved. And on that day, that February the 22nd, when Jonathan and I walked in there after Ashley come out and got us, and he said, Daddy, I'm lost. My mind went back to August when we were coming in to a church, 3 o'clock in the morning, and the a truck crossed the center line as we was on the bridge and there's no place to go in that bus and I cried out God you've got to do something and that truck barely missed us I don't know how except by the grace of God that God picked that truck up and moved it what could have happened and it scared me it scared me and I want to tell you folks dying and going to hell ought to scare us it ought to just shake us to the core so much that we want to tell people about Jesus. And that's, that's been our heart's desire, and, and, and that's what we continue to want to do. Oh, we have our days where we're just, we hurt and we're tired, and, and sometimes we just cry. And as the song says, sometimes we just can't get it right. But when we cry out to the Lord and we realize man Lord you're there you never left he can just make things alright listen to the message of this song I looked up hearts the name of the rest of the church crowd I know the routine I can list all the Bible studies in town Watch Christian TV I know all the preachers and their cliches I've been born again Without a doubt I know I'm saved but sometimes I hurt, sometimes I cry, sometimes I can't get it right. No matter how hard I seem to try, sometimes I fall down, some all over my own disguise, cause I try. The whole world looks on. Sometimes I moan, I cry. I try to speak faith. Never give the devil one inch to get in. I do worship and praise. Everybody knows just where that I stand. On the back of my ride, there's a fish and a the world to see. I know my God is good all of the time. There's no time for me. But sometimes I hurt. Ooh, sometimes I cry. Sometimes I can't get it right. No matter how hard I seem to try. Sometimes I Cause 
our child of the strong As the whole world looks on Sometimes alone I cry Sometimes I fall down Stumble over my own disguise Cause our child of the strong As the whole world looks on Sometimes alone I cry I try to look strong As the whole world Blessed face I shall behold With the saints of old The half of them be told When my feet touch the streets of gold And when my feet touch the streets of glory When I travel my last weary mile Will he hold my trembling hand When before the Lord I stand Will he say my child Well the crown of life you now have one when my feet to the streets of gold And if by chance some happy morning you should miss me Don't you weep for me because I'm gone I'll be at the feet of the one who died for me When my feet touch the streets of gold And when my feet touch the streets of glory when I travel my last weary mile, will he hold my trembling hand? When before the Lord I stand, will he say, My child, well the crown of life, you now have one. When my feet touch the streets of gold, when my feet touch the streets of glory, when I travel my last weary mile, will he hold my trembling hand? When Will the Lord I stand? Will He see my child? Will I crown of life? You now have one. When my feet touch the streets of gold, when my feet touch the streets of gold. Amen. We uh. This week, as we were down in uh, at the church, there's a church called Cherry Grove Baptist Church, and uh, uh, I've never seen such green pastures before. Uh, I mean, you know, I live up just south of Magnolia, Arkansas, and uh, there's hay meadows everywhere, but I don't know what it was down there. But as we drove through one day going over to a church camp, the fields were just green. I mean, this lush green. And I really begin to realize only God can do that stuff right there. You know, and as we were making our way back up here this afternoon and we passed by all the cornfields, and there was one uh, field where they had just harvested the, uh, the wheat, and it was just bright gold out there. That's God. You know, sometimes I think we miss God in the small stuff. We look to see... A miraculous miracle and say oh that's God well it is God but even in that pure green leaf that's on the tree on that corn stalk that's only God there's no other way to explain it is he real to you I mean just I want you to understand that how real he is About a month and a half ago, we were in El Dorado, Arkansas, doing a revival. And I preached on, is God real? And a couple of weeks after that, we were gone on a, a long trip, and Ashley had called John, Jonathan, and, and she began to give him these words. 
And as I began to hear what she had penned, I thought how true it is. We read the accounts in the Bible and we look at them and we say, oh, that was just then. But he's real, people. He is so real. Listen to this song. Is he real? Peter wants all the water Trusting in the Lord Jonah went to Nineveh Preaching out God's word The angel shut the lion's mouth Saving Daniel's life most of us won't spread the word about how Jesus lives in our life. Is He real? Can you see Him in your life? Is He real? The one who gave up a life. He died upon the cross So we can live eternally Save me from a fiery hell And he set my soul free Every day we go through praises to the King. We go to Sunday school, but do we learn a thing? It's time to spread the word of Christ and stand for what we believe. It's God real in your life. Or is he just a tree? Is he real? Can you see him in your life? Is he real? The one who gives a blind their sight. Is he pray that he's real in your life. Uh, you know, the one of the things that uh, I'm really beginning to realize is I thought God was real until I really began to seek him. Until I really began to go after him, did I not truly understand who God was from the smallest to the greatest of things. And two years ago when the Lord spoke to me about stepping out in faith, He became real. Because I didn't have anybody else to put my trust in. I said, Lord, I trust you and I, I want to do what you want us to do. And I was talking to my pastor this afternoon as we were making our way up here and I was sharing with him some of the uh, 
the report that we had uh, at this revival, we, we saw 12 saved at this revival. So we were just celebrating and praising God for the souls that accepted Jesus Christ. And one of them this morning was a 71-year-old gentleman. Uh, and, and so it, it just thrills my soul. And, and so we were rejoicing, and he said, uh, Brother Dave, he said, you remember when you and Miss Penny come over and sat on my couch? And he said that you were going to step out in faith. He said, look at what God's done. Look at what God has done and how he's used you. See, you're no different than I am. He'll use you the same way if you just allow him to. But one of the things that, that I wanted to talk to you tonight about was incomplete obedience. I had prepared this message in the middle of the week. And as Brother Mark would tell you, sometimes God changes the plan at the last minute. So I stuck it back in my Bible, and when I walked in the door, Brother Mark, he said, you going to preach tonight? And I don't, I'm not going to be honest with you, I ain't going to miss a chance to preach. I love to sing and I love to play, but there ain't nothing like preaching. When you open up God's Word and you break that open, I, man, there's nothing like it. I love the books, First and Second Samuel. Uh, I, I love the, to see what God did through so many things. But incomplete obedience. I can remember growing up and my daddy would tell me, uh, son, don't lie to me. Don't tell me a lie. I want you to go and do this. And then I would come back and I would halfway do it. He called it a halfway job. Basically what it was, I was obedient to a certain point. I went and did it, but I didn't do it the right way. I did it the way old Dave wanted to do it. Most of the time that got me in trouble. Most of the time that got that little thin belt come slipping out of that pants and in a heartbeat and blistering my behind but we find here King Saul we find out that he has given an assignment Samuel comes to him the Lord has uh, told Samuel what to tell Saul and we find that Saul he's I think he's probably got his chest out at that point because the Lord wants me to do something for him but he didn't follow through so if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Let's take a look at a few scriptures tonight and, and see what God's got for us in this. We're going to start at verse 8 and uh, read through verse 11. And uh, So if you have your Bibles and once you found that, would you stand and honor the reading of God's Word? 1 Samuel chapter 15. And verse 8. Verse 8 says, And he took Agai king of the Amalekites alive, utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agai, the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lamb, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a time to come and to worship you. And Lord, we thank you for a time to come and to open your word. Now, Father, I pray that you'd be with us tonight, you would speak to us, and God, that you would open our, our hearts and our minds to hear from you. And Lord, I pray right now that you'd use me in any way you see fit. Lord, it brings you glory and brings you honor. Lord, I want to lift you up and raise you up high, hold the banner high that you're so worthy of. Have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We find out that Saul it was given a command by the Lord. We find over in verse 3 that he told him to go and he commanded him to go 
and utterly destroy everything. From the animals all the way up to the men. Everything. Nothing left because of what happened when the Israelites crossed through and the Amalekites attacked them. And so God told Samuel and Samuel told Saul what to do. So we find out as Saul goes out, he's got the commandments, he's got the instructions, he knows what he's supposed to do, and he gets his army together and he begins to go out. And while they're out there taking care of business, he and the people decide to not follow the commands that the Lord gave. The first responsibility was Saul because he was king. I want you to understand that when God gives you a command, it's for you. It's for you to follow through exactly with what he's saying to do. It's not to halfway do it, to do it part of the way or the way that you think it is. It's the way he says to do it. And so we find that Saul here, he goes in and he takes the king alive. And then he sees all the nice animals out there. Well, those look really nice. And the people begin to say, hey, we could use those. And so they bring them back. We find that after all of this has happened, the Lord again speaks to Samuel. And he's greatly displeased. And we find that immediately the Lord is displeased with Saul because of the fact that he took and he didn't follow through. And so he regrets that he set him up as king, that he anointed him to be king. A lot of times I think God is that way with us. You say, do you think that? The Lord regrets saving us? No. I think he regrets that we don't follow through with what he tells us to do. See, because three years prior to me surrendering to the Lord and shutting down that business, the Lord had already spoke to me. But I was going to do it old Dave's way. I was going to try to continue on because I wanted that secure, to be safe, to feel secure that I was in control of what was going on. But what happens when we decide to take the control instead of giving it to God? We end up like Saul. We end up deciding to change the format. We end up deciding to, to, to move this line down just a little bit and move this over here to where it fits our itinerary. And all of a sudden we find that the Lord is displeased with us. And he said, man, I wish I'd have gave that assignment to somebody else that would have followed through. Well, Samuel, he's pleading with the Lord all night. Samuel already knows what's fixing to happen. And my friend, when God takes his hand off of you, man, it's, it's not good. It's not good. Well, we find it says... As we go on along here, if we re read on down a little bit, old, old Saul's pretty proud of himself. He's, he's feeling pretty good about the, uh, the spoils that they've brought back. He's feeling good about the battle. And verse 12 says, so when uh, Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went up to Carmel and indeed he set up a monument for himself. Now look, he's done got so excited. He's proud of what he did. And he's, he's done built him a monument out there so everybody will know who he is. That's just like us. We do something and for the Lord, and even though we didn't follow through with it, kind of stick our chest out a little bit and say, serving the Lord. We didn't follow through. So we find us seeing his way up to meet Saul that day. Saul is... So excited to see Samuel the prophet. And he's just babbling on about what happened in the war. And finally, Samuel says, be quiet. And he begins to, to tell him what the Lord said. The Lord begins to rebuke Saul because he didn't follow through. And immediately we find that Saul begins to try to talk back. Samuel says, you need to listen. See, a lot of times in our lives, that's what we want to do. We want to, instead of accepting blame that we messed up, we want to try to throw it off on somebody else. Because you find that 
as you go on down a little bit further, you find out that uh, old King Saul, he says, well, the people made me do it. It's the people's fault. It's not mine. Who did God give the assignment to? He gave it to the king. King Saul had the assignment, but he didn't follow through. And so we find that as Saul, he's trying to reason with Samuel. And he says, oh, he said, no, we, we did what, what the Lord wanted to do. And Samuel says, well, what's that baying in the background I hear? See, there shouldn't have been any sheep. There shouldn't have been any oxen. There shouldn't have been anything because he was to utterly destroy everything. And Samuel begins to blame it off again. Well, it was the people's fault. They're the ones that wanted to bring it back. And we want to blame things off in our life. I've been there. I've been there. I've been the one that didn't follow through with what the Lord wanted me to do. And I wanted to blame it off on something else. Well, the sound system wasn't working right that night. That was the reason. Well, we was late because of the fact I was, I was trying to talk to somebody. It wasn't about the Lord, though. Every excuse in the world of not complete obedience. And so we find that Samuel, he begins to really, as Saul is, is trying to convince him that he, he did right, that he followed through, he did everything that he needed to do. But Saul doesn't listen, and Samuel begins to tell him this. And we find over in verse 22, he says, Samuel says, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? The Lord wants our obedience over sacrifices. He wants us to obey Him. And when we obey Him and follow through and do what He wants us to do, I believe He smiles more than all of the things that we could sacrifice to Him. And I know these folks were lit, were in the time of the law. But my friend, I want to tell you it applies today. It applies today to our lives if we'll be obedient to what God's told us to do. If we'll follow through every step. Oh, you don't have to wonder what God wants you to do. If you'll study His Word and you'll pray and you'll seek His face, you'll know. You won't have to guess. You won't have to say, well, I think this is what He was wanting me to do. I think He was wanting me to go over here and... Talk to this person. I, I think he wants me to go share testimony over here. Hey, he wants us to do that all the time. See, so it's not a question. Complete obedience. So we find as Samuel continues, he says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of the rams. It's better to obey the Lord and to do than to try to cover it up with some uh, awful sacrifice. See, Saul was trying his best to say that they were going to take these best and they were going to sacrifice them to the Lord because King Saul didn't obey and he wanted an out. He wanted an excuse. That's just like us. When the Lord convicts us and shows us where we've sinned and where we need to repent and confess and get back right with Him, we want to try to find somewhere else to put the blame on. We want to look over here and we want to say, I'm not as bad as this person over here. I, I'm not doing what they're doing. And, and then we look over here and we say, well, uh, I know that I'm better than they are. But we just need to obey what God's saying. We need to follow through with everything. Complete obedience. Because we find if you go on down here, you find because of the disobedience of King Saul, the Lord removed his hand and it was, it was bad throughout the rest of the time. You find that 
Time goes along and David comes into the picture. Saul's trying to kill David over and over. Because the Lord had anointed David to be the new king. Saul knew that the hand of God had been removed. Complete obedience. Incomplete obedience causes chaos. Causes confusion. When you try to take the steps that God has ordered and placed and shown you, and you try to route them a different way, you're changing what God's called you to do. You're going out on your own. We find that Saul went out on his own, and he messed up. He didn't do what the Lord set out for him to do. When we find complete obedience, if you go over to the book of Acts, you find the Philippian jailer story where Paul and Silas were obedient to what God was telling them to do. As they were preaching and testifying and, and they'd gotten thrown into prison because of the fact that Paul had cast a demon out of a woman that was a, a fortune teller and the owners got mad because took away their income and they had been put into prison but Paul and Silas were obedient they didn't back up they did what the Lord told them to do and they were singing and praising the Lord about midnight and the earthquake happened chains shackles fell off doors flew open all they could have left but they were obedient to stay and it affected the whole household of the Philippian jailer. So much that he cries out, what must I do to be saved? And he got saved and then his household accepted the Lord and got saved. That's what obedience does. Obedience is just like this. You take a rock and you throw it on a pond. The ripple, that whole complete pond. It doesn't miss an and when we're obedient, that's what happens. Our obedience creates blessings. It affects everybody around us. If I'll follow through with what the Lord's wanting David to do, it affects my wife. It affects my son. It affects Ashley. It affects Stephen. It affects people around us. Everything. Same way with you. Obedience, complete obedience. King Saul, the first great assignment he had, he flubbed it up. He had just followed through. Things would have been different. That's the way it is in our life today. If I would have listened three years prior when that tornado come through and ripped the top off of the store, and I, if I'd have said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We might have had the opportunity to see more saved than we've seen. I know we would have. I know that I would have seen the blessings that I've got to see since I've been obedient. Oh, it wasn't that I was doing anything wrong. But it wasn't the perfect will of the Lord. When, when you get into the perfect will instead of the permissive will, things begin to change. No other place I'd rather be than right in the center of what God's wanting me to do. It's a sweet place. Saul was there. He had clear instructions. He was of a good sound mind. He knew what the task was. He didn't even have to guess. But he went in and self began to jump out. I believe I'll take this back and I'll take this back and I'll take this back. And what happened? Sin entered into the camp and disrupted the camp. And by doing that, the Lord removed his hand off of Saul, took the anointing away. And chaos began to fill the kingdom from that point on. If we'll be obedient, completely follow through with what God's wanting 
us to do. See, what he's called me to do is different from what he's called you to do. What he's called you to do is different from what he's called me to do. But if we'll just be obedient, that's the main thing, the following him. I think about Ashley. Singing was not her comfort zone. Little did she know that that's what God had in mind, was preparing her for the last three years, preparing her for a lifestyle, because it's not easy riding that bus and being gone all the time. Oh, it looks fun from the outside, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'll be honest with you. That's what God's called me to do. But we really won't even be home till about the 18th of June. And being home would just be what I'm talking about a couple of days, and then back on it again. And I'm thankful for it. It's a beautiful piece of equipment. And it does what it's supposed to do. It gets us from point A to point B and a place to sleep. But she was being groomed. The Lord was placing her. And she realized when the time came and I asked her, I said, would you fill in? And she stood up there and I knew without a doubt. I said, you know that God's placed you here. First she said no, but then it was just a little bit. She come back and she said, yeah, I believe he has. He'll use you. Or it may not be to get on the bus to go sing, but it may be just to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, he is on my heart. It might be to send them a text message and say, hey, I'm praying for you today. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I'm praying for you. Hey, is there anything I can do for you? All of that is obedience. Then that obedience will create blessings. Tonight, if you're here and you've never met Jesus personally, Jesus died on a cross. He came as a babe in a manger. Born of a virgin. Grew up 100% man, 100% God. Felt everything that you and I will ever feel in a lifetime. The pain, the agony, the, the bruises, the soreness. He worked. He was a carpenter by trade. Then, it went so much further. As he began his ministry, began to preach repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand he felt all of the anguish he felt all of the people that talked bad about him then he felt it as he was beaten not once but twice and then was crucified died and rose again on the third day and now he's seated at the right hand of the father in heaven interceding for you and I and he loves you so much that he was willing to go through all of that and he didn't even have to and yet that's the love that he has for us so that we could call upon his name realize that we were lost and undone and needed a savior and cry out to him and say Lord save me forgive me of my sins and I believe exactly who you are and he said he'll do just that he said for whosoever will may come tonight if you never accepted him we give you that opportunity it's not mine to give by the way it's the Lord's but tonight would be a great time because the Bible says that today is the day of salvation no other time but right now because we're not promised the next breath Maybe if you're here and you've been dealing with some things that the Lord has placed upon your heart, or it might not be to, to go out into a traveling ministry, it might just be to follow through with what he's called or told you to do. 
Maybe there's some incomplete obedience that needs to be resolved tonight. Maybe there's some things that the Lord has just dealt with you about. Wants to do this. I want us to stand, Brother Mark, if you'd come to the front and we want to have a time of invitation and and I just want to I want you to know that whatever God is dealing with you about, I pray that you'll be obedient with that and that you'll follow through and that you'll surrender all. And you'll do exactly what he wants you to do. And if you don't know him as Lord and Savior of your life, Brother Mark would be honored to take his Bible and show you how to be saved, tell you how to be saved, and show you in the Scripture what it says of how to be saved. Whatever it is that the Lord is dealing with you tonight, would you surrender to Him? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for a time to worship You and thank You for a time to open Your Word. Now, Lord, I pray that You'd be with us in this invitation time and that we'd be obedient. And Lord, we wouldn't be by like go King Saul and not follow through, but we would follow through with what You want us to do. Have Your way. In this invitation time, in Jesus' name. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust. hope you enjoyed that service and if God spoke to you during that service and you've realized that you need a savior and that you're lost and undone and why don't you call out to the Lord he's just waiting to hear from you he already knows and you know as well as anybody if the Holy Spirit is drawing you and right where you're at you can call upon him see God can hear a whisper all the way to heaven from right where you're at because he sees your heart. Why don't you ask him to come in and be your Lord and Savior to forgive you of your sins? He's waiting on you, but it's something that you have to do. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, then you don't have a personal relationship. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes to know Jesus Christ is a personal relationship. So if that's you and you, you would like to receive Jesus into your heart and start this relationship, I'd ask you to pray with me. 
but pray in faith, believing that he'll save you. And he says he'll do just that. So why don't you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that you died for me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and you rose again. And right now, you're in heaven. Lord Jesus, I'm lost. And I need you to save me. Forgive me of my sins and come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. Now I want to live the rest of my life serving you. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer in faith and asked the Lord to save you, I want to be the first to tell you that you're saved. And that you're on your way to heaven if you prayed that prayer in faith and believed and asked God. We'd like to hear from you. You can contact us at thecrusaders-ministries.com. You can find us on Facebook. Send us a message. Or give me a call, 870-904-3118. We'd like to find out where you're at and get you involved in a local church, try to help you start your walk with Jesus Christ in a positive way. But we're excited what God has done and we look forward to hearing from you. And if you'd like to partner with the Crusaders, you can become a seed partner by sowing a seed and meeting a need. We're a 501c3. We're a nonprofit organization. You can go to our website, thecrusaders-ministries.com and you can Give safe and secure there. You can give a one-time tax deductible donation or you can set it up to do monthly and it can just come straight out of your account. Whatever it is that God has placed upon your heart, I pray you'd be faithful to do that. And of course, if you have any questions or concerns, you can contact me, David, at 870-904-3118. Thank you again for watching this service and I pray it was a blessing to you. And God bless you.